at his lecture, at his lecture he chose the soldier who was related to our poet. And it was about how a soldier who was wounded coped with their changed bodies in their post-war lives. The impact of the war on one of the wounded warriors. What I want to report is that, I don't know whether we're gonna be able to do this. Uh, the book, Wounded for Life, will be out in September. At the moment, it can be purchased online, but um, I won't have another opportunity to tell you and follow up on that, so we're doing it today. And that, of course, leads me to Dr. Holly Pinero, who is our speaker for today. He is the Assistant Professor of African American History at Furman University. And he is quite the author. He has been, uh, some of his work has received awards and um, he is not finished with his subject. He will be researching it further. So what we have is Dr. Pinero examines the intersections of gender, race and class and region to fully illuminate the experiences of Northern USCT soldiers and their families. So we are reaching an era where we are including the families in the research of our soldiers. And that is pretty wonderful. So with that, I'm going to let Dr. Pinero take over. All right, can, can everyone hear me? Okay, so firstly, I would like to thank Joyce Workman, Martha Woods, and I'm Martha, I will be following up with you. I took copious notes on what you uh, were, we were privileged to hear, and I'm excited to uh, talk with you more. And I also thank James, Dr. James Paradis and everyone for your time, especially on a Sunday. <laughs> I'd also like to just note briefly that part of the reason I do this work and emphasize uh, military families is because I am the son of someone who's two uh, service members. Um, more specifically, my mother was a combat veteran, served for 25 years in the United States Navy, and it was the reality of seeing her difficulties, particularly as a veteran, that drove me to do this kind of work. <clears throat> I do want to disclose that the images that you are going to see are not necessarily the individuals that I will be talking about. Many of them come from the Library of Congress. Um, but I, they do, I hope, demonstrate a visual of the importance of the people we're talking about. All right. On April 8th, 1884, Mary Williamson, the widow, Benjamin Davis, a deceased soldier in the 6th United States Colored Infantry, or USCI, arrived at the Bureau of Pensions local office in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Williamson came to provide testimony to a special examiner regarding the validity of a minor's pension case for her now adult son, Jerome. During the deposition two years earlier, the presiding pension agent, who was a white man, questioned the legitimacy of Williamson's common law marriage to Benjamin and that of their child. Now, maybe she had grown tired of having to explain herself to a federal government representative as she emphasized how the Civil War forever changed their family. <clears throat> And I'm going to read a direct quote that's a back and forth between these two individuals. And if I'm being honest, uh, truly shocked me when I saw it in the National Archives. Quote, I kept him, Jerome Davis, until he was seven or eight months old, when I took him to his grandfather's at his father's request. And he, his grandfather, has brought him up and took him ever since 1864. What is the reason you do not keep her care for? Because I had to go to service and they were willing to care for. They, the United States Army, drafted men and left me no means of support to work ourselves." End quote. 
Williamson's statement illustrates, I believe, the harsh reality that she and countless other working poor African-American Philadelphians experienced during and long after the Civil War officially ended. The scholarship on United States Colored Troop or USCT regiments has long emphasized aspects of military service, such as wartime mobilization, and rightly so, as USCT soldiers sacrificed their lives for the greater good of the Union and for their enslaved brethren. Some soldiers used their service as a direct pathway for African-American male suffrage. Others served to have their manhood recognized by white society. The lived experiences of working for Northern USCT families, however, has largely been overlooked. <clears throat> Williamson's testimony, I believe, sheds light on how the war tore African-American Philadelphian husbands from wives, fathers from children, children from parents, and friends from friends. The USCT was pivotal in carrying out the Union's military objectives, yet the mobilization of hundreds of thousands of able-bodied African-American men into service devastated many of these families. And some of these families were left to grieve and struggle economically after their male kin sadly died in service. Other families tended to disabilities, physical, emotional, and psychological, of the surviving veterans while also fighting to survive financially. <clears throat> now, before diving into the specifics of my book, I at least wanted to highlight uh, where my book fits in the larger scholarship. Now, even with the wealth of USCT scholarship, one might, uh, might forget that it was not until the 1950s when modern scholars recognized the historical significance of USCT soldiers, more specifically, Frederick M. Bender and Dudley Taylor Cornish published studies that provided overviews of the USCT experience. James McPherson in 1965 followed suit with the examination on the processes of wartime mobilization and the immediate post-war experiences of African Americans. And to be honest, that book, I forget the title, it's something like The Negro Civil War, and it's a super long title. That was one that I read my junior year, and I was very uh, important to my desire to continue on with my studies. Now, collectively, these scholars sought to illuminate what they thought was a forgotten past. Quote, the history of the Negro soldier in the Union Army has remained an obscure chapter in American history, end quote, Cornish writes. Now, for white non-academics and scholars, this statement was perhaps correct, but numerous African Americans knew otherwise. In fact, during the late 19th and early 20th century, historical analysis of USCT regiments primarily came from African Americans. African-American civilian William Wells Brown composed his monograph, The Negro in the American Rebellion, His Heroism and Fidelity, His Fidelity, in 1867, after noticing that white historians either downplayed or ignored the historical significance of black regiments. Quote, I waited patiently before beginning this work with the hope that someone more competent would take up the subject in hand. But up to the present, Brown laments, it has not been done, although many books have been written about the rebellion, end quote. Meanwhile, the literature of William J. Simmons, George Washington Williams, Joseph T. Wilson, Alexander Heritage Newton, and Isaac J. Hill all investigated the soldiers' wartime sacrifices. And I do want to also acknowledge uh, that some USCT veterans made it their personal mission to inform civilians, including Carter G. Woodson, Happy Black History Month, about their wartime exploits. But it is also important that we recognize people like Susie King Taylor, a formerly enslaved woman, who published her experiences as a freed woman becoming a laundress and a nurse for the 33rd USCI, along with the post-war struggles that she and her family experienced. More specifically in the post-war, she talked about her veteran husband, Edward, who was a master carpenter um, before serving, but was unable to resume that work, not due to any disabilities, solely because of his race. Thus, African-Americans and some of their white allies were fighting for the inclusion in the historical memory of the Civil War, that would not materialize until the modern civil rights movement. Now, five of the men previously mentioned served in Northern African American regiments, more specifically Simmons enlisted in the 41st USCI, Wilson in the 54th Massachusetts uh, uh, connected to the film Glory, Williams in the 13th USCI, meanwhile Newton and Hill both served in the 29th USCI. Afterwards, all of these veterans became historians to confront white scholars and non-academics that even some African Americans who were ignoring the historical significance of Black Civil War soldiers. For instance, Simmons lamented in 1887 the fact that his students, most likely at the Simmons College of Kentucky, knew little about USCT soldiers when he said, quote, I have noticed in my long experience as a teacher that some of my students are woefully ignorant of the work of our great colored men, even ignorant 
of their names, end quote. Simmons states, ultimately the family civil war builds upon the efforts that they and others started over 130 years ago to uncover the personal histories of these soldiers and their extended families as they define them to bring their names and experiences to the forefront. Now, historians tend to focus on isolated moments of USCT soldiers' experiences, either wartime or post-war, to illustrate the various hardships that they and their blood-related kin experienced. Wartime studies illuminate how racial discrimination in service made the military experience for all African-American men dramatically different from all other soldiers. Some detailed how white officers readily meted out physical punishments on USCT soldiers who, because of their supposed racial inferiority and trustworthiness, were thought to have deserved such punishments. Meanwhile, Margaret Humphreys argues that due to racially discriminatory policies based off pseudo-racial science, USCT soldiers primarily performed fatigue duty in harsh climates, which led to more deaths from illness and disease than from Confederate weaponry. Meanwhile, veteranhood scholars stress that white pension agents, who were primarily white men, discriminated against and routinely denied African-American Civil War pension applicants, primarily on the conviction that they're all liars. I do want to give a shout out to Dr. James G. Mendez, who is the only scholar um, to date other than myself to place Northern USCT uh, families at the center of a book-length study, though his work uh, limits the investigation to the letters of African-American women, mothers, wives, sisters, and family friends. I will be honest that that is an excellent book. The book is titled A Great Sacrifice, came out in 2020. It is a really good book. <clears throat> now turning to my work. Now it is well known, thanks to a growing body of scholarship, that the enlistment campaign for Northern African-American men in cities such as Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, that war propagandists, including Frederick Douglass, Henry Highland Garnett, and Anna Dickinson emphasized the supposed responsibilities that able-bodied African-American men had to emancipate their enslaved civil brethren. And for those who are interested, Henry Highland Garnett on the top left of your screen, he will actually be the first chaplain for the 20th United States Colored Infantry out of New York State. Unfortunately, he will not be able to hold that position uh, throughout the war's existence because of a physical disability. Uh, but he and his wife, Julia, were very important. Julia Garnett did phenomenal work supporting, and many other Black women, supporting the Black soldiers in New York State as they trained because they recognized that the U.S. War Department was failing to do its job. <clears throat> now, the, en oh, sorry. the enlistment rhetoric claimed that demonstrating one's patriotic manhood would allow them to acquire full citizenship rights, including voting rights, possibly. War propagandists collectively recognized that all USCT soldiers, sadly, would experience racial discrimination in service. Even so, potential recruits were told to focus on ending slavery, while simultaneously proving that African-American manhood paralleled white counter. <clears throat> in doing so, war propagandists believed that it could lead to USCT soldiers and African Americans possibly attaining post-war rights, such as the right to vote and the protection of their civil rights, all while refuting uh, negative racial and gendered stereotypes through military service. Now, unfortunately for many Northern African American families, wartime mobilization ignored the dire economic situations that they experienced every day in American society. And the removal of able-bodied African-American men hindered an ongoing economic crisis for many of these working poor African-American Philadelphian families who were already suffering due to racial and gender discrimination that impacted their lives. And in some cases, their financial woes continued generations after the war officially ended. Now, military service did not exist in isolated segments of the soldiers' lives. Although different from soldiers on the front line, the families of USCT soldiers also dealt with the consequences of military participation as the effects had the ability and sometimes did reverberate to the home front in ways that very few, including the soldiers, could have ever fathomed. <clears throat> it is also important to recognize that the notion of that serving in a USCT regiment would demonstrate the plausibility for creating a racially egalitarian society, though it would only occur if African-American men became soldiers and defenders for a nation that legalized slavery and the oppression of any Black person within its borders, though it also ignored the fact that these men would most likely have to die to do so. In many instances, there was not a recognition of how it would directly impact their families. 
At the same time, surviving the war did not necessarily improve the socioeconomic standing for many of the enlisted men or their families. <laughs> Sorry. Now the question always becomes, why Philadelphia? Now, if I'm being transparent, part of it was because I wanted to see if there was any connections to my own family, because I have a number of family members that are in the Philadelphia area. And also it was a lot cheaper to do the research sleeping on a relative's couch. But in terms of the why Philadelphia, I believe it was the ideal location to examine three Northern African Americans who navigated a city with extreme partisan and racial politics where racial violence, including large scale race riots, were commonplace throughout the 19th century. Still, they had one of the most significant free Northern African American populations in 1860, with over 22,000, which was over or about 4% the city's total population at that time. Philadelphia also had a prominent abolitionist network that included nationally recognized activists, such as Octavius Cotto, Lucretia Mott, and many others, which I believe make it the ideal place to examine. And obviously, many of you will be familiar with these. The images you see on the left side of your screen is the depiction of the Pennsylvania Hall burning in 1838. And then I believe the one on the right is the depiction of the Flying Horses Riot, if I'm remembering uh, the dynamic of that one. I use these examples to demonstrate through the work about how we need to contextualize. And if we put into context through the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, that African-Americans were born into a race war long before the Civil War ever came into existence. Now for the first book that I'm work I worked on, I wanted to only focus on the first three regiments from Pennsylvania, that being the 3rd United States Color Infantry or USCI, the 6th and the 8th, which all trained in Philadelphia where the majority of recruits took place. In essence, Civil War military service was inescapable for African-American Philadelphians or anyone really by 1863 as the militarization of the city and its populace pressed onward to support the war effort. However, Many people advocating for African-American men to enlist in the United States Army seem to either ignore or downplay the harsh reality of life that all African-Americans experienced <clears throat> due to racial and gender discrimination that permeated every facet of Northern society. And they lived through this every day as they battled for their survival, literally and economically. Now for this first book, I in total, I focused on 185 Philadelphia native-born men in one of these three Pennsylvania USCT regiments. To be clear, this number that I examined does not even comprise 1% of the city's total African-American population in 1860. And since each regiment usually capped at about 1,000 enlisted men, the soldiers that I investigate encompass about 6% of the collective regiment's population. Regardless of their small proportion, every one of their lives matters. <clears throat> Moreover, these men were never merely cannon fodder or military laborers or emancipators. These men were fathers, brothers, sons, cousins, and friends to a marginalized segment of Philadelphians and Pennsylvanians residing in households where individuals, sometimes children as young as five years old, had to contribute to their family's household finances to stave off poverty, if only temporarily. For example, one of the uh, veterans that I had the privilege of examining his name was Francis Hawkins. He will talk about this exact case in his pension records. The man served perfectly during the war. In the post-war, he literally travels the United States. He becomes known as the old black veteran barber. He's traveling everywhere from Arkansas to California to Oregon and playing into the fact that he was a veteran to continue to get clients. But that's not what he talked about in pensions. What he wanted the federal government to know was that when he was a child, he could not attend school on a regular basis. And it was not because he didn't care or value education. It was because of the people in his home were not making enough money that he had to contribute. And that is important that we acknowledge that that veteran is talking about the real war for him was the denial of access to education. And that is important. <clears throat> now, for those who are, are interested, even though I said that I'm looking at 185, the project actually looks at nearly 1,000 individuals, including the veterans, in these multi-generational families as they dealt with the long-term financial ramifications of the Civil War and its military service. 
Now, primarily due to the continuance of occupational racial discrimination, racism that the men dealt with in service, and racial discriminatory practices throughout the Civil War pension application process for both an invalid or veteran and their dependents collectively jeopardized the finances of many of these working poor African-American Philadelphian families. And these effects were felt far beyond any degree that the federal government, war propagandists, or the soldiers themselves could have ever fathomed once the call to arms officially came. <clears throat> now the question becomes, how did I do the research? And I'm happy to talk about this for those who are interested. Uh, I'll just give the quick list for the primary sources. Civil War pension records, which are a gold mine. I cannot stress enough how amazing those records are. The one thing I'll say, and this is something that a National Archive archivist uh, told me, is truthfully, they're not sure what's in many of these records. And one of the reasons that came out was when I was looking at Francis Hawkins' pension record, there was a uh, photo in there that they didn't know was supposed to be in there. And they only realized it when I was holding it and said, I don't know if this is supposed to be in the file. To which they said, nope, that's not. So that's the beauty of these records. They talk a lot about these people's lives. When I was a grad student, I pitched a project about soldiers and veterans remembering the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment. But what I found in the Civil War pension records was conversations about unemployment, disability, a lack of access to medical care, the demands to be remembered and valued. And this is gonna to totally spoil the book, but hopefully if you're interested. And I say that because one of the pension records had a letter from the desk of Eleanor Roosevelt during the height of the Great Depression. And that was because a daughter of a USCT veteran from Pennsylvania decided to write and plead to the first lady to look into that case. And all I'm gonna say is that the, the first lady of the United States of America responded to this woman in less than, I believe it was like five, or three days. I can't get people to answer an email in two weeks. But to me, that demonstrates a commitment that the first lady remembered, but also that that daughter demanded to be heard. And that is very important. And I'll say this, black women's voices ring very loudly in the pensions, especially grandchildren, and great-grandchildren in some instances. Um, if you're really interested in this, uh, Dr. Hillary Green at Davidson College is also doing some great work on this. Compiled military service records, which you can find through your local library, um, through Ancestry.com. And for those who are interested in that, make sure that you actually go past the muster out sheet. That's when I started to find a lot of gems. For example, those are when I found the personal, the letters in which officers were providing furloughs particularly to married soldiers, under the, under the assumption that only married soldiers have people that care about them, right? But those are, I would just say, is make sure you're looking all the way through the back. Compiled military, or sorry, regimental books, published memoirs. I also looked at the 54th and 55th uh, city directories, the federal census. That's how I was able to find out the women in these people's lives and to contextualize where they're coming from. Public speeches from prominent individuals, black, white, men and women, Union League club records for Philadelphia and New York City, and newspapers, including uh, the Christian Recorder, which I'm going to assume the audience knows about the African Methodist Episcopalian's connection. But I'll also give a shout out to the Weekly Anglo African that published out of New York City, which I believe you can actually still get through interlibrary loan. That is a great resource. And what I've noticed is in some instances, the Christian Recorder and Weekly Anglo African were actually publishing. Uh, pieces in conversation. So I would strongly recommend that. So now I want to briefly highlight one of the examples from the people that I studied. <clears throat> in 1842, Andrew White, the son of Sarah and an unnamed man, was born in Philadelphia. Sarah, for undisclosed reasons, became a single mother raising four children, including Andrew, by herself, until she married James Reeves on an undisclosed date. In total, the couple would raise seven children, which created a significant economic burden on the family, as James was the only documented, and that's important, full-time wage earner working as a laborer due to racial discrimination, which was common as an occupation for many African-Americans to support the family. Perhaps Sarah found part-time work to bolster the family economy in between raising the children, which many Black women did. And if you're interested in that, Dr. Jane Dabble, D-A-B-E-L, has written a book about that. It's called A Respectable Woman. 
And that's focusing on New York State, specifically New York City, but there's a lot of important conversations in that book. <clears throat> now, none of the seven children uh, attended school when they were school age. Now, their absence from school was not unique, as many other working for African-American Philadelphian families chose not to send their children to racially segregated schools that were inferior in many ways to their white counterparts, such as having unqualified and openly racist teachers continuously dealing with funding problems as well. Other families needed children to forego receiving a formal education and required children, sometimes as young as five years old, to find wage earning employment, even temporarily, to supplement their household income. Now, it is entirely plausible that the Reeves children, including Andrew, had these experiences, which illustrated that race defined one's access to education and a social hierarchy that ignored an individual's age. <clears throat> now, for Andrew, reaching young adulthood forced him to assume more familiar responsibilities after his stepfather was no longer able to perform his duties as a laborer after incurring a ruptured hernia and rheumatism due to an exposure while working. Andrew was able to find work as a farm laborer, earning $8 per month. That number is important. He was earning $8 per month as a farm laborer. The majority of his wages went to help his parents and siblings survive, as he was the sole full-time wage earner in the home. Now, Andrew's familial obligations were well known to members of his local community. Jason Seaman and Henry Ellis, both childhood friends of Andrew, later testified to the federal government that he was critical as the provider for the entire family after his stepfather's afflictions materialized. As a bachelor, Andrew assumed the idealized male role as the breadwinner, even though his stepfather resided in the household. Perhaps this gave Andrew a conflicted understanding of gender ideology that many middle-class Americans championed. Alternatively, maybe what mattered more to Andrew was keeping his family economically stable through his labor, which meant that material realities for this particular working poor family were starkly different from Victorian era genders. Now, uh, I usually say this in all my presentations, so I'll just do it in this one. The image on the left of the screen is the picture from Camp William Penn. I will say that I am in the process, and it's gonna take a long time, that I'm doing an entire study of Camp William Penn and their families uh, which I've done some preliminary work on. The image on the right is the regimental flag that Black women and David Bowser helped paint. <clears throat> Eventually, Andrew answered the United States mobilizing calls, and he enlisted on August 12, 1863, joining the 6th U.S. Senate. Records do not reveal what his motivation was for serving the military. However, it is clear that his decision created an immediate problem for his entire family as he did not receive his $100 federal enlistment bounty as a payment would only occur after his service. And unfortunately, he and his family were being punished for what were called bounty jumpers, which was something that particularly white men in both militaries were doing long before black military service was even a thing. <clears throat> the Reeves family was now without their breadwinner, and it meant that their finances became extremely chaotic as patriotism and militarized manhood trumped familial responsibilities. Now, serving in the U.S. Army did not cease Andrew from seeking to maintain a close relationship with his family back home. On March 25th of 1864, Andrew wrote Sarah and informed her of his time near camp at Yorktown, Virginia. In the letter, he exclaimed his adoration for his family on the home front that he missed dearly. Andrew then complained about his financial woes that were making it harder for him to communicate with the entire family. When he wrote, quote, Dear Mother, I hope you do not think hard of me for not writing any sooner. I could not write you any sooner because paper is very hard to get here without any money, end quote. <clears throat> Perhaps his complaint about an inability to afford paper was due to the inefficiency of military paymasters who rarely paid any soldier in either military in a timely fashion. One of my favorite jokes, I believe William Marvel uh, mentioned in one of his books, is that the most hated person in a military camp was the paymaster when they didn't have money, but the most loved person in the camp was the paymaster when they had money. <clears throat> in terms of Andrew, he will then beseech Sarah to write him so that he can remain updated on how his family was doing in his absence. And it is feasible that Andrew's request was his way of recognizing how his military service jeopardized the finances of his family. Now, for men like Andrew, armed combat was a defining component of military service, and without it, he felt his service was incomplete. When he wrote, quote, I have not been in a fight yet, but I have been in some very hard, some very, oh, very marches 
horrified, but the rebel was afraid to stand up, end quote. Andrew's proud tone reveals that his and the regiment's manhood was on full display, while that Confederate soldiers were, in his opinion, void of masculine patriotic honor due to his, sorry, due to the unwillingness to engage in armed combat. Maybe his family took pride in the confidence and bravery that Andrew showed, but it also meant that their family member pined to sacrifice his life. Now, in terms of this image, this is actually a depiction of the Battle of Alusty, which happened in Florida, and many uh, Pennsylvanian uh, soldiers were, took part in this event. There is actually some very important work that's being done by Dr. Barbara Gannon, G-A-N-N-O-N, at the University of Central Florida, to acknowledge the fact that this site at Alusty is just basically an open space. So there are many Black and white veterans who are basically not being acknowledged as having died um, in that site. So that if you're really interested in the legacies of that, there are still people fighting this ballot battle. But the image will also uh, help with this point I'm unfortunately gonna bring it up. Sadly, Andrew's wish came true and he received an injury on June 30th, 1864 at the Battle of Point of Rock in Virginia. He would later die from those injuries. Once the news came home, his mother promptly applied for a mother's pension in the hopes of receiving some financial compensation after her son died. Now, she was only qualified because Andrew had died a bachelor. Otherwise, she would have been ineligible for a pension. None of his siblings um, were eligible since they were neither the wife or the offspring, and his stepfather, for unknown reasons, did not apply. Though I've seen at least two examples of fathers applying for and successfully receiving a father's pension. Now, Sarah had her application approved, and she would collect Andrew's $100 enlistment belt and a pension of $8 per month, beginning in 1864. That would continue. She would continue earning for the remainder of her life. In 1886, her pension increased to $12 per month. In 1896, it rose to $33 per month. And as historian Larry Logue has argued, pensions were only meant to supplement an individual's Members of Sarah's local community, such as H. Powell, stated that throughout the late 19th century, that Sarah frequently depended on the kindness of her neighbors to survive. Quote, she is a widow, over 70 years of age, and quite decrepit. She has been supported on the charitable people of her neighbor, end quote. Additionally, Sarah resorted to selling candy and cakes to bolster her finances whenever possible. And since Sarah was the only documented individual in her household receiving money, it is feasible that it was rarely, if ever enough, to provide fiscal stability for an entire family. Now, becoming a pensioner did not stop the federal government's representatives from investigating the private life of Sarah or truly any uh, person who hoped to become a pensioner. Shortly after James died of pneumonia in 1886, Pension agents began an invasive examination of his employment and disability history to determine if Sarah should keep her pension or if she had been defrauding the federal government all along. <clears throat> Thomas Hoffman and Henry Gamble both testified that it was James's disabilities and not a dereliction of his supposed male responsibilities that kept him from working. Meanwhile, multiple childhood friends of Andrew confirmed that he was the sole full-time wager for their family, which confirmed Sarah's financial dependency. After the intrusive inquiry by the federal government, Sarah's pension continued. But it was only after questioning her validity and documenting her hardships to appease the skepticism of those agents. In the end, Andrew continued contributing to his family even after death. But it is plausible that his family would have rather had him return home safely instead of receiving financial compensation for his passing. Thank you. Looks like this might be the time to raise questions. If you are going to raise a question, you will be, please be sure to unmute yourself so that we can hear you. Uh, this is Camille Bird. And I thought that that was really very interesting about the pension that the widow would get and how they really um, um, 
investigated everything to make sure that that Andrew was qual uh, qualified for that. Mm -hmm. So did they do this for all the soldiers? Oh, <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> I know this is a great question. I'm going <laughs> to list off a bunch of scholars who have done work on this um, mm -hmm. just to so if you're really interested in getting into this, because there's a lot on it. The short version to your question, yes. Like it was truly invasive. That's where the book's title comes from, if I'm being honest, that these families were at war with the federal government over how they define themselves versus how the federal government assessed the, whether they were legitimate or not. Um, so scholars, including uh, James G. Mendez, who has done work on Pennsylvania, um, met the late Megan McClintock, uh, Brandy Brimmer, who's written a book that's called Claiming Union Widowhood, came out 2020. That's a phenomenal book. Megan McClintock, um, her dissertation should be available. I would put her dissertation up against most people's books who have won awards. And then uh, Nora Lee Frankel, she wrote a book that's called Freedom's Women, which is about Black women fighting the Federal Pension Bureau in Mississippi. And then lastly, I'll say is uh, Donald Schaefer. And I think his book is called After the Glory. That's like, so I would say that I'm in conversation with all, and, and Chandra Manning, and there's many others um, who are basically getting back to Joyce's point. We need to acknowledge how these families were at war too. Oh, and Dr. Hillary Green has actually a new book that will be coming out this year. And I'm not going to spoil it, but I'll just say this. She's the direct descendant of nine different USCT soldiers from Pennsylvania. Oh. And she is doing a groundbreaking book. I've already read it. Trust me, you want to read it. Because she. the short version is she's going to war now with the federal government to get the records of her family because they're not in the National Archives. And now, so, now, who was that? Uh, so that's uh, Dr. Hillary with one L. Green. Her book is not out yet, but right. she, it's, it's coming. It's going to be out with Fordham University Press. She, You can email her, let her know. I, I, I said, you know, her email, she's a phenomenal scholar, but she is she is actually fighting this battle now. Okay. Well, you you really have ran off a lot of names. So, I but <laughs> no, it's okay because you have a a, 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 a lot of information, uh, which is wonderful. So I you know I already have one book in my uh Amazon um uh to buy but about all where all the uh, the black soldiers are buried because I just mm -hmm. heard that so yeah. I just uh, so if I have to I'll you know I'll write her but I'll also be looking for that book by Dr. Yeah and I like I said um I strongly encourage you to read um, the late Megan McClintock's dissertation there like that is a phenomenal study and she really she gets into a lot of the things that I am grateful in my my scholarship. Okay. I see two more hands raised. Oh, sorry. Um, Abigail, I don't know how to. Abigail and Nicholas. Hi, Professor. It's nice to see you again. I was yes. on uh, the Library of Congress. I signed up for this and didn't realize it was you, but so it's nice. <laughs> to see you again. I, I'm great. <laughs> Glad to see you. <laughs> yeah, I have one quick cl clarifying question. I feel a little stupid asking, but I'm going to ask anyways. Mm -hmm. um, and then just a follow-up question. The first question being is, where I know Black soldiers enlisted. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm reading this book about Emily Davis. She was a Black woman uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. during this yeah. time. And it was mentioned that they were drafted. There is yes. So like, were they required to serve in the Civil War? That's my first just like basic general comprehension question. Mm -hmm. And then my second one is, like, I never really thought about it before when you were mentioning Douglas and his rhetoric rhetoric being like war <laughs> propaganda yeah um, because you know not everyone wanted um black men to serve mm -hmm. i was wondering like if you have a recommendation for like primary sources from this time period that encourage yeah. black people not to serve in the civil war so <clears throat> first it's great to see you again um, yeah so the the first thing is your question the first one about the draft somewhere uh, I will just say for this book, my research, I don't focus on that as much. However, I would say that that is something that might be of interest to you. You, If you want to find that, you can actually, 
Sometimes, not always. You can actually find that through the compiled military service records through uh, Ancestry. The same thing, like I said, when you, if you've ever looked at those records, is you have to go past the muster out sheet where it says where they mustered out, whatever money they have, blah, 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 blah. Sometimes that information on their enlistment process or the drafting process is in there. And I'll just say, and I didn't, and it didn't make the book. One of the soldiers actually writes on the edges of his document to his wife, I'm going to most likely die. This is the only evidence you have that you're my legal wife. And it was just like that they're coming to terms with their own mortality in those moments. And some of them actively get married the same day that they're enlisting because they recognize that this might be the end um, in terms of their existence. <laughs> And then I would say to your question about propaganda, and I struggle with this one because I, I love Frederick. I love all of them for their importance. For me, it's, I want to acknowledge, and this is something that I'm trying to tackle with my new work, the ableism in enlistment and the rhetoric. And I say that because as someone with multiple physical disabilities, I couldn't do this work. I couldn't serve. And what is what does that say when someone like, someone I admire, Frederick Douglass, is saying, you're not a man unless you do these things which to me is like, I can't even if I wanted to, but then also the reality of what it meant for their families. Um, some of the, the works that I lean on is Alfred M. Breen, who if I'm, an audience can correct me, I think he was a famous uh, Philadelphian African-American lawyer. Um, he published his dissenting, well, supporting, but then the responses to him were sometimes, and I think it was the Pine and Palm, the Weekly Anglo-African, and they actually had articles early in the war that were saying, we should not enlist. This is not a war for us, right? So I would say double, like if you skim the weekly angle African, they have a lot, but the rhetoric changes quick. So it's like 1861, no, no, 1862, we're not sure. And then pretty much late 1862, let's go. But it, to me, it's just like that, that shift is really interesting because I, I'm blanking off the top of my head, but I do believe that also there was an, uh, and recruitment campaign done in various Philadelphian churches, and a white individual stood up and was like, no, why should they? And even that just made me pause and think, what does it say that people were saying? Why should they? And then lastly, it gets back to the opening of the presentation. <clears throat> so Mary Williamson, Mary Lee, she will basically say, you won the war. I've never seen my son again. Right, and so it's like, I try to contextualize what she's saying to the federal government in 1884, and what Douglas and others are saying, 1863. And she's saying, congratulations, war is over, slavery's ended, where's my son? Where's my husband? Where's my family? Sorry, I hope that answered. <laughs> so, yes, um, it did, thank you. Thank you, and great to see you again. Uh, let's see, let's see, Nicholas and Eric. <laughs> Uh, Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes. Good. All right. Um, wonderful to hear from you. Uh, I uh, I teach at um, uh, at uh, Frank Leonard Marshall College. Um, up oh, to I'm a resident of the Lamont area. Um, I I have a question. I I thought I heard some echoes of Chandra Manning's uh, "What This Cruel War Was Over," and was so happy to hear you make the connection there. And I, I have to say, I, I'm so, I think it was Abigail, the last speaker, I think, um, especially towards the end there, I, I, I'm so glad that she went ahead of me, that mm. there seemed to be, uh, there seems to be a real connection there. And I found with some of my students that that is, it is a book that I think they appreciate because of the question of, you know, that comes up every, every mm. election year of, uh, mm. you know, or it was about, thank you, Nick. Right. Turn that yeah. up again, but uh, <laughs> I'm I'm wondering, like you know, how um, it it seems like it's a book that doesn't get enough press. It it seems like there's important work being done in there, and it seems like you're building uh, from it, getting these stories, but then maybe carrying it beyond a little bit. And mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, if there was, uh, sorry, this is such an academic question, but if there was <laughs> a, you know, some type of a intellectual relationship going on there uh, as you were working. Yeah, I mean, like I'm, thank you for your question. So in the, the very short version to, to answering yours is Shandra Manning 
and then I'd say this to the audience. Chandra Manning is amazing, like truly amazing. Like I've I've had the privilege of talking to her a few times, and every time I'm like, I am not worthy to even be on the screen with you. Right? Now. She is a star. Um, but I and just hearing you talk made me also think I do need to give acknowledgement to Tara Hunter, who I believe her book, oh gosh, Bound and Bound and Wedlock, Bound by Wedlock which is also talking about mar USCT soldiers and their spouses and what she calls marrying under the flag, which is something that I'm going to tease out for Camp William Penn because I found records of people getting married at Camp William Penn. I'd also say I build upon William Surreal, uh, his book on, on New York State. That's a book that does not, in my opinion, get enough uh, credit um, in terms of the importance of its work. And truthfully, and I'll say this name until I'm blue in the face, like Chandra Manning is, and Norley Franklin, their work is truly groundbreaking and does not get enough attention. But to your question is like Chandra Manning and all these other scholars, I'm I'm so grateful to be in conversation with them. And I will say, having read Dr. Green's book that's coming, it's going to change everything, I promise you. I don't want to spoil it other than say buy it. <laughs> her, her book, not mine. <laughs> that's, a, that's a book. Thank you for Thank you. Uh, thank you for answering. Thank you. Uh, let's see, Eric and Dave. Yes. Good afternoon, Dr. P. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Yes. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, sir. Great. So I volunteer at Camp William Penn as their secretary. Mm -hmm. But the question I have is based on an excerpt you put in your book concerning mm -hmm. the National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers. Mm -hmm. The question I have is that word volunteer, does that mean that men that were drafted mm -hmm. were ineligible to be housed and cared mm -hmm. for in that institution? Thank you. That's Eric, that's a great question. And thank you for your service. Uh, to illuminating these people's lives. Now, I'll give you the, the short academic answer is I would say that that is a question, and of course I don't have all my books with me to give it. I would I leaned on the work of Kelly Mezarek, and I wanna make sure I pronounce her last name right, M-E-Z-U-R-E-K. She's written a book that, or sorry, she's written a, well, she's written a book that is actually on Ohio's USCT that is phenomenal. Um, and she talks a lot about it in that book, but she also wrote an essay in, a, in an edited volume, I think it's called The War Went On, which is all about veterans, black and white. And she has a whole chapter on the, uh, the disabled homes. And what she actually argued in there is that they were racially inclusive. Uh, so I would say I, <clears throat> the nuance of the disabled home is something that we must continue to examine because Kelly's, Dr. Mazarek's work upended what I had originally thought with my dissertation. Um, and so again, her, her book is called For Their Own, uh, it's gonna, For Their Own Work or For Their Own Freedom. It's about the 127th USCI out of Ohio. I cannot stress it enough. And more specifically to your question, I wanna say it's the last three chapters where she talks about the pensions, but also the disabilities. She talks quite a bit about that. So I would say that would be the gem. So again, it's Kelly, M-E-Z, U-R-E-K. Tell her I sent you. She is awesome. And in fact, y'all should invite her out. She is, she's an amazing person, but a great scholar too. Thank you. So, Dave? Thank you. Thanks so much. So my question also in a way had to do with uh, invalids and also orphans. I wondered, um, I thought I've encountered uh, that there were orphanages that were for um, orphans of colored soldiers mm -hmm. that were separate and um, and I and I wondered if there was advocacy on behalf of I'm, so many things that were in the quote unquote colored community had to be I, I hear what your stories are about individuals having to mm -hmm. chase their mm -hmm. case individually mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so many other situations um, within the community had to be pursued. There was there was benefit by working mm. together yes, in, yeah. in society. And I'm wondering why I, I'm not hearing you speak about 
them working together in advocacy uh, together to try to find successful strategies or, um, I don't know, I'm just curious if, if you have a comment on that. Oh, I do. Um, so the, the short uh, to that is, yes, there were orphanages uh, <clears throat> in Pennsylvania and other places. So in terms of this talk here, obviously I can't get into the, whatever, I forget how many pages, it's 200 something pages. I do quite a bit about uh, exactly what you're talking about. And so what I will say is Dr. Brandy Brimmer, so it's B, B with an I at the end of her first name, B-R-I-M-M-E-R. -M -M -E her book is called Claiming Union Widowhood. Uh, I actually got that as a Christmas gift in 2020. And the reason I say that is because your question about and everything you're asking is, is on point. Her book is all about that exact question. And I say that because I, after I got that book, she calls it the Grassroots Pension Network. So basically she, what she was saying, and I 100% agree with her, is that once an individual went through the, the pension examination process, whether it's getting a lawyer, whatever, they would tell each other this information, right? For example, where not to go, who not to talk to, which lawyer to get, which lawyer to not get, right? And, and more specifically, where what kind of information you need to have accessible right and so i do examine and go into that in much more depth in the book however if you want what i would consider the book to really do that justice it's dr brimmer's book because i even told her after i read it i couldn't have done my book without reading your book so i would say if i'm remembering it right she breaks her book up into two parts the first part is all about what you're talking about. And then the second part of her book, which is great, is about the individual studies. So I would say that with, to your question, yes. And that is something that I will continue to tease out much more in future studies. So thank you all for these great questions and lots of notes. May I uh, ask a question? Yeah. I see a lot of researchers here. May I suggest an easy avenue to research? The Camp William Penn website that Joyce had spoke about, mm -hmm. there's 400,000 documents there. Okay. Uh, every, soldier's, every soldier's complete military records, lots of death certificates, photographs of the officers, lots and lots of stuff. But an easy avenue, uh, I did research on the Philadelphia National Cemetery, mm -hmm. and there's only a portion of the, uh, the 1,000 Black Civil War soldiers and sailors that came from Camp William Penn. There's another mm -hmm. mother of the non Camp William Penn soldiers and the sailors. Mm -hmm. What I'm going to uh, tease some of you researchers is uh, I have I have all their, uh, I've done research on the rest of the uh, soldiers and sailors at, at the Philadelphia mm -hmm. National Cemetery. Mm -hmm. If you really want an easy research, uh, go to the Navy on Fold 3. Mm -hmm. uh, the military records and the pension records are co-mingled for the Navy. And when you download those records, you'll get, I've gotten as many as 300. Wow. No, this and is great. I mean, thank you for this. Thank you I'm for sure doing this. What whole three is. Yeah. So uh, the Navy, and I found some uh, rather surprising uh, things, which. Yeah. And to that uh, point, and I know Jim, James. You may have a surprise in the future. Well, trust me, as the child uh, of a. Do, uh, do go to the. Um, uh, look at the Navy. Yeah. Okay. So there are scholars that are doing that phenomenal work. I know James, I hope I'm saying his name, but James Rammel has done some, and also uh, Joseph Reedy, who also wrote one of the first like really good books about white officers and black soldiers. I will say that Dr. Jonathan White has also been very gracious with his uh, research and has given me basically everything. However, I will take you up on your advice as well, uh, Edward, um, because I want to do this project justice, uh, truthfully, and I say, and I'll just close with this. While this book won an award, and I'm very grateful for that, it made a positive contribution to global society. For me, it's this kind of moment, right? That Joyce sent me an email. It's that descendants are in this room. That a descendant read my book, um, and gave me their approval. Like this is why I do this. Like to to illuminate these people's lives and to demonstrate that they, like everyone in this room, is important.
and matters. And so thank you all for your time today. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It means more than you will ever know. And maybe one day I can be there in person. That's the dream. Well, yeah. well when he comes to Philadelphia to continue his research, we'll be ready for him, won't we? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I have a question. And, sure. and only, I'm, I'm raising my physical hand only because I can't I can't find the little thing hand, you know, the little yellow hand. Mm. Um, I'm with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Pinheiro. I've thank been you. seeing your name for a long time. Uh, and I you. also want to uh, say hello to Edward McLaughlin, who I saw uh, at an event last Sunday. But we'll get into that later. My question is... Um, with with all the information that you have, mm -hmm. what do you what do you know about? Uh, was there any difficulty in the in the black soldiers receiving uh, headstones for their buildings? Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's... <laughs> and the reason and and the, re and the reason why I asked that question is because you know I'm representing Mount Zion Amy Church in Devon, okay. in, which is in Chester County, and also I'm a member of the Pennsylvania Hallowed Grounds. And okay. our two focuses are um, any USCT soldier in any cemetery in the state of Pennsylvania, black, mm -hmm. white, public, private, wherever mm -hmm. they are, we want to be able to honor them mm -hmm. and list them on our ongoing list. And mm -hmm. then the other focus is African-American cemeteries, period, in the mm -hmm. state of Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So that's 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 my curiosity. Firstly, thank you for everything that you're doing. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Um, I would say I, I have not engaged as much with the burial sites. I do have, and I have to go back and look through my computer for some of that. That is something that I will be much more attentive to and uh, will definitely reach out to you. I have heard and want to give props to the great work that the Pennsylvania Hallowed Ground uh, organization does. Dr. Hillary Green has actually spoken very highly of y'all. So just want to give that. And I'm actually... Even though he's not in Pennsylvania, there is something that I at least want to do for myself, is I found that one of the soldiers, I believe, I want to say the 8th USCI, he was actually captured, became a prisoner of war, and died in Andersonville. So I found, and they actually, had, you can find online his headstone, but for me, of course, Tombstone, I want to actually go there and place flowers there to acknowledge, right, that like he still matters. So I think that's the other part is like, where they go, and I'll just close with this. Even though he's not a Pennsylvanian, one of my soldiers who was from, well, technically he's from Virginia or uh, Tennessee, he ends up going to New York, post-Civil War, he becomes a sheep herder in Australia for five years, then and then travels to Hawaii when it's an independent nation state, comes back and lives, and I believe buys a residence not far from where he was formerly enslaved. So to me, it's the beauty of what they're doing with their freedom of movement. Uh, but I will keep this question in mind about the headstones because I have a, a colleague who does work on them, uh, particularly for African-American cemeteries. So I will also just uh, reach out to her. But I just wanted to, again, close with thank you all so much. This means more than you know. Truly grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pinheiro, and thank you, thank everyone, you. for attending. Uh, thank you for your wonderful questions. Yes, thank um, you. Camp William Penn Museum will be opening the beginning of June, and all of a sudden, I think we're going to be faced with a lot of questions we hadn't thought about before. So um, thank you for coming, and I hope to see you this summer. Hope to see you lo local folks at Camp William Penn Day and um, everything in between. And uh, thanks to Jonathan White. If you remember his lecture a couple years ago, he was sitting on the balcony of his parents' condo overlooking the ocean in Florida. And he was our first intern. So um, Jonathan White is very special to us. With that, unless somebody has something else um, that we need to take note of, 
um, I am going to close the session for this year. And we'll see you all back at Black History Lecture next year, wherever we're going to, whether it's on Zoom, whether it's in the community center or a combination. One of the wonderful things is the attendance that we can have from around the country when we're on Zoom. So thank you very much. And one of our descendants is, is on the screen at the moment saying thanks. So uh, with that, thank you, Dr. Pinheiro. And I am sure that we have not seen or heard the end of you. <laughs> and that, that will be our pleasure, our privilege, and uh, our advantage. Thank you very much. With all of that, goodbye, everybody.